Bienvenidos, soy Magdalena Gómez y hoy le traemos otro episodio de Vecinos Neighbors, un programa semanal que nos trae nuevos puntos de vista de nuestros vecinos en Holyoke y la comunidad latina del Pioneer Valley. Hello, I'm Magdalena Gómez, here to welcome you to another episode of Vecinos Neighbors, a weekly program that brings you new points of view from my neighbors in Holyoke and the Latino community in the Pioneer Valley. On today's program, we'll have the poetry of Martin Espada, who will read from his book, City of Coughing and Dead Radiators. Born in New York City to a Puerto Rican father, Martin Espada performed a number of jobs before he decided to dedicate his time to poetry. His book was recently published, and this year, he is a professor at the University of Massachusetts. And afterwards, we'll listen to Jack Agueros, a Puerto Rican writer of New York, who will share for us a section of one of his short stories. Después escucharemos a Jack Agueros, escritor puertorriqueño de Nueva York, que nos leerá una selección de uno de sus cuentos. I'm going to read mostly from my new book tonight, and uh, I want to begin with uh, an island poem. Since it is a new book, I don't know where the hell the poems are, so. <laughs> Start with an island poem. Uh, the basic fact in terms of the island, of course, is that it is a colony of the United States. It's about the one thing everybody can agree on across the political spectrum uh, over there. And this poem, on one level, is simply about a friend of mine. So it's very personal. On another level, it's about that colonialism. It's about the history of repression and uh, surveillance of independentistas, pro-independence activists on the island and elsewhere. It's about then why the island is not independent yet, but also about why it will be someday, that spirit. The poem is called the lover of a subversive is also a subversive. <laughs> the lover of a subversive is also a subversive. The painter's compañero was a conspirator, revolutionary convicted to haunt the catacombs of federal prison for the next half century. When she painted her canvas on the beach, the FBI man squatted behind her on the sand muddying his dark gray suit and kissing his walkie-talkie, a pallbearer who missed the funeral train. The painter who paints a subversive is also a subversive. In her portrait of him, she imagines his long black twist of hair. In her portraits of herself, she wears a mask or has no mouth. She must sell the canvases for the FBI man ministered solemnly to the principal at the school where she once taught. The woman who grieves for a subversive is also a subversive. The FBI man is a pale-skinned apparition staring in the subway. She could reach for him and only touch a pillar of ash where the dark gray suit had been. If she hungers to touch her lover, she must brush her fingers on moist canvas. The lover of a subversive is also a subversive. When the beach chilled cold and the bright stumble of tourists deserted, she and the FBI man were left alone with their spying glances as he waited calmly for the sobbing to begin, and she refused to sob. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and I first visited Puerto Rico when I was about 10 years old. And like any kid, I experienced uh, that new sensation primarily through five senses. Being a fat kid, I experienced it primarily through my mouth. <laughs> but there I was like Pac-Man going across the island, <laughs> eating, drinking. And I discovered something, and quite inadvertently, I discovered what you might call the taste of colonialism, because you taste it. 
Um, it's in the water, it's in the food. And that's what this poem is about. So you might call this my cultural imperialism or vacation poem. <laughs> it's called Coca-Cola and Coco Frio. <laughs> On his first visit to Puerto Rico, island of family folklore, the fat boy wandered from table to table with his mouth open. <laughs> At every table, some great aunt would steer him with cool, spotted hands to a glass of Coca-Cola. One even sang to him in all the English he could remember, a Coca-Cola jingle from the 40s. He drank obediently, though he was bored with this potion, familiar from soda fountains in Brooklyn. Then, at a roadside stand off the beach, the fat boy opened his mouth to coco frio, a coconut chilled, then scalped by a machete so that a straw could inhale the clear milk. The boy tilted the green shell overhead and drooled coconut milk down his chin. Suddenly, Puerto Rico was not Coca-Cola or Brooklyn, and neither was he. <laughs> For years afterward, the boy marveled at an island where the people drank Coca-Cola and sang jingles from World War II in a language they did not speak, while so many coconuts in the trees sagged heavy with milk, swollen and unsuckled. some things that happened a few years later. Um, I actually wandered here and there. I ended up in law school. And I went to Northeastern in Boston. And while there, I began to realize that there were some contradictions between the life I was leading now and the life I used to lead. <coughs> contradictions that some of my students, my fellow students, were not aware of. Uh, they were not aware of the price that is paid for the symbols of daily oppression we find all around us. And I began to reflect on a job I held in high school, which had a connection to this law school experience, a very strange connection. Uh, this is a poem which actually, uh, we, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, my compañero Roberto Marquez before the reading, so I want to actually dedicate this poem to Roberto and particularly his mother. It's called, Who Burns for the Perfection of Paper? At 16, I worked after high school hours at a printing plant that manufactured legal pads. Yellow paper stacked seven feet high and leaning as I slipped cardboard between the pages, then brushed red glue up and down the stack. No gloves. Fingertips required for the perfection of paper, smoothing the exact rectangle. Sluggish by 9 p.m., the hands would slide along suddenly sharp paper and gather slits thinner than the crevices of the skin, hidden. Then the glue would sting, hands oozing till both palms burned at the punch block. Ten years later, in law school, I knew that every legal pad was glued with the sting of hidden cuts that every open law book was a pair of hands, upturned and burning. Eventually, graduated from law school and <laughs> spent most of my career as a lawyer working for an organization called Su Clinica Legal. Su Clinica Legal is a legal services program for low-income tenants, mostly Latino, uh, in Chelsea. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know Chelsea, uh, Chelsea is a tough little town right across the Toten Bridge from Boston. 
It is year after year the poorest municipality in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That is an oxymoron, Commonwealth. Um, and now, as a gateway city of immigrants, it is uh, about 45, 50% Latino. Uh, Puerto Rican, Dominican, um, Guatemalan, Nicaraguan, Salvadoran. One night I couldn't sleep. I was thinking about all those people I had seen pass through my office and pass through that courthouse. And the following poem emerged. Uh, the poem is the title poem of the book, City of Coughing and Dead Radiators, Chelsea, Massachusetts. I cannot evict them from my insomnia at night. Tenants in the city of coughing and dead radiators. They bang the radiators like cold, hollow marimbas. They cry out to unseen creatures skittering across their feet in darkness. They fold hands over plates to protect food from ceilings black with roaches. And they answer the call on the list. All evictions in court, raise the clip. Quiet and dutiful as spectral troops returning, they file into the courtroom, crowding the gallery. The patient one from El Salvador, shoemaker's union refugee, slapping his neck to show where that vampire of an army bullet pierced his uncle's windpipe. The red-haired woman with no electricity but the drugs heat, swimming in the pools of her blue bruises, white skin as the candle she lives by, and will move this afternoon for a hundred dollars. The prostitute swollen with pregnancy and sobbing as the landlady sneers miscarriage before a judge poking his broken hearing aid. The girl surrounded by a pleading carousel of children in Spanish bewilderment, sleepless and rat vigilant, who wins reluctant extermination but loses the youngest, lead paint retarded. The man, alcohol popped graph of scars stretching across his belly, locked out, shirt stolen, arrested at the hearing for the rampage of his detox hallucinations. The Guatemalan boy who listens through the wall by his father's landlord defiance staccato, jolted awake by flashes of the landlord floating over the bed, parade balloon waving a kitchen knife. For all those sprawl downstairs with the work boots crusted map printed on the back, the creases of the judge's face collapse into a fist. As we shut files and click briefcases to leave, a loud-faced man trumpets from the gallery, Death to legal aid! <laughs> children's parties. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to see if Paul Mark can take that. <laughs> Actually, uh, the law is my favorite source of amusement. <laughs> Allow me to uh, document that. Things actually got so bad in Chelsea that the courthouse building itself was condemned. <laughs> but not before I got some good poetry out of it, literally off of the bathroom wall. This is a short poem called Courthouse Graffiti for Two Voices. <laughs> Jimmy C, greatest car thief alive, Chelsea, 88. Then what are you doing here? <laughs> I look back here, there's a coat of arms back here. It's like, it's like there's a couple of badges. It's the city of New York. Okay. Obviously, we're in New York City. It makes perfect sense. I admire very much the tenacity of the people in our community. I'm thinking now both about the clients that I mentioned and uh, friends, family that I know. This is a poem for somebody who's not here tonight, but uh, she lives and works in the area. And it's based on a story she told me. Uh, the story has to do with a common situation for people in our communities, with another 
dilemma of language, uh, what you might call a dilemma of bilingualism. I mean, one dilemma of bilingualism is that uh, you know, if you go to school and you learn two languages in college, you're considered a genius. <laughs> but if you're born and raised with two languages, you're considered an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Another, another dilemma is a dilemma that's actually faced by children in our community who are compelled to translate for their parents. And uh, most of us here uh, know that situation. So this is a poem about that, and it's called Borofels, or Sonia Kiem. In Brooklyn, the mice were crazy with courage, bony gray pickpocket snatching crumbs from plates at the table. The roaches panicked in spirals on the floor, or weaved down walls for the sanctuary of cracked paint. No heat, so the oven door drooped open like an immigrant's surprise. Sonia's mother was mute in English, mouth chapped and coughing without words to yell for heat. But the neighbors spoke of Borofels. Tell Borofels, and mice shrivel in traps, roaches kick in poison heaps, Steam pipes bang so loud that windows open in winter. Sonia and her mother sail on a subway train rocking like a ship desperate for light and rose in an untranslated territory of Brooklyn. So Sonia translated. Where is Borofels? No one knew. The girl, pinballed by strangers in a hurry, hooded against frost as mouths puffed quick clouds of denial. Sonia saw the uniform then, blue-coated trooper of the U.S. mail and pleading for Borofels. His face, drowsing in bewilderment, awoke with a gust of what he suddenly understood, and he pointed down the street. You want the Board of Health. <laughs> <laughs> they could yell now, like banned poets back from exile. <laughs> I want to do one, actually I wasn't planning on doing this one, it's from my last book, but I want to do it because there's a special friend here, Camilo Perez Postillo, who uh, co-translated this last book, Rebellion, uh, bilingual, and it's also about an experience we had together working as lawyers for an operation called META, uh, Multicultural Education Training and Advocacy, which is a bilingual education law firm. And uh, we got a call one day, speaking of the dilemmas of bilingualism, we got a call one day from uh, Lynn, Massachusetts. So please come up to Lynn over at the high school. They have banned Spanish at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Reasons of digestion, I assume. <laughs> this is more common than you might imagine, the Spanish language being perceived as a threat and banned outright certain times and places in the public schools. And, uh, so we went up there and we dealt with the problem. It is rumored that the principal still wakes up in the middle of the night screaming about the Spanish lawyers, as we came to be known. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wrote this poem as what you might call an olive branch, with thorns on it. Um, I'll do the poem. It's a short poem, first in Spanish and then in English. The poem is called The New Bathroom Policy at English High School, or Nueva norma para el baño en la English High School. <laughs> Los muchachos cacarean español en el baño mientras el principal de la escuela los oye desde el inodoro. <laughs> <laughs> la única palabra que reconoce es su propio nombre. <laughs> Y eso le va estremeñiendo. Por tanto decide prohibir en español los baños. Ahora puede rejalarse. The boys chatter Spanish in the bathroom while the principal listens from his stall. 
The only word he recognizes is his own name. <laughs> and this constipates him. <laughs> so he decides to ban Spanish in the bathroom. So now he can relax. <laughs> This is a poem which is about the fact that that whole bureaucracy experience has seeped literally into my dreams. Uh, this was a dream I actually had right after the birth of our son, Clemente, at the end of December 1991, and it's called DSS Dream. <laughs> I dreamed the Department of Social Services came to the door and said, we understand you have a baby a goat and a pig living here in a two-room apartment. <laughs> this is illegal. We have to take the baby away. <laughs> Unless you eat the goat. The pig's okay, I ask. The pig's okay. <laughs> bass player. You may have noticed by the way, the world's biggest violin in the corner over there. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, the man who plays that instrument up here with me now. His name is Michael Marcus. He's going to play his bass while I am reading. Not too loudly. <laughs> This, uh, this uh, next poem follows from the last one because it's also about the birth of our son, Clemente, Camilo, Gilbert, Espada, etc., etc. <laughs> um, born December 28, 1991. And this poem is a tribute to him. It's also a tribute to his mother, Catherine, and uh, to the courage they both uh, showed. And it's uh, ultimately about how each new birth for us gives us an opportunity to break cycles, in this case, a cycle of violence uh, that is part of our family histories. The poem is called White Birch for Catherine, December 28, 1991. <laughs> Two decades ago, rye whiskey scalded your father's throat, stinking from the mouth as he stamped his shoe in the groove between your hips, dizzy flailing cartwheel down the stairs. The tail of your spine split, became a scraping hook. For 20 years of fire raced across the bowels of your bones, his drunken mouth a move flashing with every stab gesture. Now the white room of birth is throbbing. The number is palpitating red on the screen of machinery tentacled to your arm. The oxygen mask wedged in a wheeze on your face. The numbing medication injected through the spine. The boy was snagged on that spiraling bone. Medical fingers prodded your raw pink center while you stared at a horizon of water no one else could see. Creatures leaping silver with tails that slashed the air like your agonized tongue. <coughs> you were born in the river valley, hard green checkerboard of farms, a town of white birches and a churchyard from the workhorse time. Weathered headstones naming women drained of blood with infants coiled inside the caging hips. Hymns swaying as if lanterns over the mounded earth. Then the white birch of your bones, resilient and yielding, yielded again. Roots snapped as the boy spilled out of you into hands burst open by beckoning and voices pouring praise like water. Two beings 
tangled in exhaustion, blood painted, but full of breath. After a generation of burning, the hook unfurled in your body, the crack in the bone dissolved. One day you stood, expected again the branch of nerves fanning across your back to flame, and felt only the grace of birches. Two more. What these last two poems have in common is that they're both about the right to speak. And those who defend the right to speak, who sacrifice everything for the right to speak, sometimes even their lives. And without those sacrifices, none of us would have anything worth having. So I celebrate that spirit of resistance. And these two poems have that in common. This first poem was written after I visited San Antonio, Texas a few years ago. I know some people here from San Antonio. <laughs> Right. I was there, I had a chance to visit the Alamo, <laughs> and I made a connection between that and the last time in Espada, my family anyway, visited San Antonio, which was in 1949, when my father was stationed there at Lackland Air Force Base. And I recall, too, an incident that happened with him when he was refused service in the segregated lunch counter. And I began to realize that that was the other Alamo. That's what this poem is called, The Other Alamo, San Antonio, Texas, 1990. In the Crockett Hotel dining room, a chalk-faced man in metal uniform growls a prayer at the head of the veteran's table. Throughout the map of this sink-hungry city, hands strain for the touch of shrines, genuflection before cannon and memorial plaque, grasping the talisman of Bowie knife replica at the souvenir shop, visitors in white biblical quote t-shirts. The stones in the walls are smaller than the fists of Texas martyrs. Their cavernous mouths could drink the canal to mud. The daughters of the Republic print brochures dancing with Mexican demons. Santa Ana's legs still hopping a conjunto accordion. The lawyers who conquered farmland by scratching on parchment in an oil lamp gaze. The cotton growers who kept the time of Mexican peasant lives dangling from their watch chains. The vigilantes hooded like blind angels, hunting with torches for men the color of night, gathering in church, the capital of the porch for a century, all said this, Alamo. Three boys in Air Force dress khaki ignored the whites only sign at the diner by the bus station. A soldier from Baltimore who heard nigger sung here more often than his name, but would not glance away. Another blonde and solemn as his Tennessee of whitewashed spires. Another from distant Puerto Rico, cap-tipped at an angle in a country where brown skin could be boiled for the leather of a vigilante's wallet. The waitress squinted a glare and refused their contamination. The manager lost his crew-cut politeness and blustered about local customs. The police, with surrounding faces, jeered about tacos and senoritas on the Mexican side of town. We're not leaving, they said and hunched at their stools till the manager ordered the cook, sweat-burnished black man unable to hide his grin, to slide cheeseburgers on plates across the counter. We're not hungry, they said, and left a week's pay for the cook. 
One was my father. His word for fury is Texas. Okay, this is uh, the last poem. And this takes us to El Salvador. Um, I guess, again, I want to thank everybody for putting this together. This is, I want to thank uh, the Odyssey Bookshop and La Unidad, and uh, thank everybody for being here. And after, the, after this last poem, there'll be pandemonium in the lobby, and you're welcome to join us. We'll be out there signing books and engaging in the usual bochinas. <laughs> In January of 1991, I was um, quite honored to have some poems published in Diario Latino. Diario Latino is an opposition newspaper in San Valor. Uh, opposition to what? Of course, opposition to the uh, military, the death squads, the, the government there responsible for tens of thousands of deaths in that country, uh, and funded, of course, by the United States, sometimes to the tune of more than a million dollars a day. And so these people have a great deal of courage, and I was very glad to see the poems come out in that newspaper. In February of 1991, a month later, the Adio Latino was burned to the ground. They didn't like your poems. I've heard of getting panned, but man. <laughs> Everybody knew who did it, of course. Now, the people at the Adio Latino didn't give up. They patched that newspaper together, a little bit at a time, page here, page there. Until finally, a year later, the newspaper was back to full strength. And the first anniversary of the fire, February of 92, this poem was published in Diario Latino. It's uh, a tribute to them. It's written in response to the fire. But of course, it's also a response to any situation anywhere where people are fighting to speak and where the voices somehow manage to rise above the flames. Many of the details in the poem come from a letter I got from down there. And the uh, poem is called, When Songs Become Water, for Diario Latino and Salvador, 1991. Where dubbed commercials sell the tobacco and alcohol of a far winter metropolis where the lungs of night cough artillery shots into the ears of sleep, where strikers with howls stiff on their faces and warnings pinned to their shirts are harvested from garbage heaps, where olive uniforms keep watch over the plaza from a nest of rifle eyes and sandbags, where the government party campaigns chanting through loudspeakers that this country will be the common grave of the Reds. There, the newsprint of mutiny is as medicine on the fingertips, and the beat of the press printing mutiny is like the pounding of tortillas in the hands. When the beat of the press is like the pounding of tortillas, and the newsprint is medicine on the fingertips, come the men with faces wiped away by the hood, who smother the mouth of witness night, shaking the gasoline can across the floor, then scattering in a dark orange eruption of windows, leaving the paper to wrinkle gray in the heat. Where the faces wiped away by the hood are known by the breath of gasoline on their clothes, and paper wrinkles gray as the skin of incarcerated talkers. Another army helicopter plunges from the sky with blades burning like the wings of a gargoyle. The tortilla and medicine words are smuggled in shawls. The newspapers are hoarded like bundles of letters from the missing. The poems become songs, and the songs become water streaming through the arteries of the earth, where others at the well will cool the sweat in their hair and begin to think. The Constitution of the United States gives every U.S. citizen over the age of 18 the right to vote. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, previous condition of servitude.
enmienda del, de ley 19 dice que, los, que el derecho a votar de los ciudadanos de los Estados Unidos no se le puede negar o limitar por los Estados Unidos o por ningún estado debido a su sexo. La enmienda de ley 26 dice que el derecho a votar de los ciudadanos de los Estados Unidos mayores de 18 años no se les puede negar o limitar por los Estados Unidos o por ningún estado debido a su edad. And one of them is a drug addict at the moment the story begins and ends. And the other is sort of thinking about what he's going to do with his life. And they're talking about a third person that they also knew, though possibly not at the same time, in their youth. And that's why the story is called Oscar's Story. Uh, for those of you who are under 13 years of age, I recommend that you leave and come back with your parents because there is some strong language here which I did not invent, but I do use it in the story. It's the Oscar story. <clears throat> Carlos and Sal have been drinking together off and on, especially on weekends, for most of the summer. Carlos was a junkie, Sal knew well. From childhood, from before he had become a junkie. And he was the only junkie Sal knew who liked both beer and wine. But like other junkies, Carlos despised rum and whiskey. If you just mentioned rum or whiskey, Carlos would make a face and then start doing something with his throat and mouth that seemed like he was having dry heaves. He had that kind of sense of humor. The kind of humor everybody had when they were all boys in junior high school together. One especially hot night when beer or wine got hot before you were even halfway through the can or bottle, Carlos looked up after a long period of staring into one blank space. Maybe it had been a reverie. It came after he had stopped nodding. That amazing balancing act that junkies do after they shoot heroin. They sway to one side, you swear they will fall, and tilted at some exaggerated angle, they suddenly pop upright. Open their eyes a tiny bit, only momentarily, and start tilting again on another. Swaying but not falling. You never saw one fall. You saw junkies all over Spanish Harlem, naughty. Sometimes they would scratch some part of their body, usually the face, arms, or legs, lightly in slow motion. Sometimes they scratch so hard you can see ulcerated skin separating and dried cicatrices on their arms or legs, around the wrists or ankles. You also saw two guys dragging a third guy between them, keeping the third guy walking to prevent his slipping into a coma or stupor, which was a way station not far from death, and therefore had to be avoided. Sal never understood the whole sequence. Considering how many junkies he knew and how many he had seen, he had never spent one whole day with a junkie. Sal didn't know what came first, a certain semi-consciousness, followed by nodding and scratching, or the scratching first, then the other. He also never knew if the junkies weren't experimenting with whatever was cheap and available, catch of the day, <coughs> and mixing heroin with amphetamines. The goofballs made them talk, talk, talk. The grass made them laugh. The heroin made them nod. And in combination, or washed down with beer or wine, what did that make them do? Maybe the scratching came as a sign that it was time for another dose. Carlos stared at Sal and then said, my father used to say, that thinking and reading too much was bad for the brain, you know? But I have met a lot of guys who thought a lot. And a lot of guys who never thought about nothing. And their brains were the same. Did I ever tell you Oscar's story? I had a cousin in Moscow who played the drums. I went to the Bronx High School of Science, see? He 
was definitely the smartest guy in the whole family, but uh, he wigged out. He went completely crazy. You know the Bronx High School of Science is one of the best high schools in the United States, right? So, his father, who was my uncle and owned the candy store, it used to be over there. But Carlos pointed to the southwest corner of Lexington Avenue and 110th Street. It had the best molten milks in the whole neighborhood, except for the ice cream parlor on 118th Street and 3rd Avenue. But you couldn't go up to 118th every day because of the Italians, and especially the Italian gang called the Red Wings. My uncle used to put out that his son went crazy because he was so intelligent and he studied so hard. You know, you gotta take a very tough test to get into Bronx science. You know that, right, Sal? But that was a whole lot of bullshit on my uncle's part. Oscar went crazy because his father, my uncle, Manolo, was a fucking tightwad. Hard as my elbow. Carlos played a fist with his right hand and knocked on his left elbow for emphasis. Tacaño, he said. Then in case Sal uh, hadn't understood, he used another Spanish word. Maceta. <laughs> hard, hard, cheap, chintzy. Sal wondered what chintzy had to do with chintz. Maybe chintz was a cheap cloth or fabric. Man, that cat was making big effing bucks from that candy store. He had the best collection of funny books. And I still remember the very clean tile floor. <coughs> had a very pretty pattern in the center. <coughs> Dark tiles and light tiles, a border of black tiles, and a few red tiles forming a diamond here and there. And the tables was round pieces of marble, and the chairs was made out of bent wire. You remember with wooden seats? They was like the side chairs in the barbershop, too, and the same chairs they had on an 18. The joint always smoked great. It smelled a little like tobacco, a little like malt, a little like funny book paper. But Manolo wouldn't give his son a dime, not one thin, tiny dime. When Oscar got a girlfriend and the old man told Oscar to bring her to the candy store and he would sell her a soda or malt it at a discount. Can you imagine that shit a discount for his son's girlfriend? <laughs> then when the girl got to the store, Manolo gave her the third degree. Then it was an interrogation. Oscar wanted to die from embarrassment. His girl wanted to run and never see any of them again, but she was a sweet Puerto Rican girl. And she just sat answering Manolo's questions politely, never looking him in the eye. What does your father do? Does he work? Where? Does his mother work? Does she do this? <laughs> but even after that, Manolo decided that his son was not studying enough and not practicing the drugs enough, and he started saying that Oscar was sinful to go out with girls. But he ought to spend his full time studying and drumming. It was too much, man. One day I went in the candy store after school, and there was Oscar taking care of the counter, doing drumming drills on his practice pad. You ever see one of those things? It's a rubber thing. A hunk of rubber on a piece of wood, see? And then drumstick bang, bang on the rubber, and they bounce back like off drumsticks, but you ain't got the noise of drums. My uncle, his father, was counting his money or some shit in the back. I know he wasn't stacking bottles, because he had slave Oscar for all the real work. I said to Oscar, man, what are you doing? Two things at once? Oscar said, yeah, my father thinks I should practice when there are no customers. Then one day, my uncle pulled the final drag. My uncle became a Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, man, I had to stop going to the candy store. The cat wouldn't stop talking, talking El Señor. Talking God, talking Jesus, the man. Every time he went into the store, he put the conversation into God. You say, how are you? He would say, thanks to God, I'm okay. <laughs> God is the source of our health. And he would go into a preaching room in a minute. Then he started having these preachers come in to break Oscar down. Telling Oscar he was sinful, because he went out with girls, and he was sinful because he didn't obey his father, and that he was sinful because he didn't practice enough and didn't study enough. He didn't want to turn his soul over to God, give his life to Jesus, or play drums in the temple. See, they never say church, they always say temple. What I figured out from listening to Oscar was that these preacher cats had never seen no real sins. So they thought all this bullshit was sins. I stopped going in the store. 
My cousin Oscar had become a maniac. He had a look in his eyes like Bob's call off. <laughs> Only Oscar wasn't acting. No matter how much I missed those Baltics, or the egg creams, or the four cent sodas. Actually, Pop's candy store in the other corner of Lexington made better egg creams, and also Pop, who wasn't the cheapskate, put more flavor in the four cent sodas. When Pop made you a lime soda or a cherry lime ricky, he let you see him putting the flavor in the salsa. And his sodas was rich in taste. They had strong color. My Uncle Manolo, he never let you see what he was doing behind the counter. <laughs> and one of his four cents sodas looked like Dracula got to it first and drank off the best part. <laughs> Things looked anemic. If I went in the store, Manolo was there, I would only buy a phony book. Then I would wait for my cousin to be taking care of the store and get my maltits. But even missing those maltits like I did, you know, I think I had an addiction to them. It was too painful to go to the store. On this side, you got Preacher Papa nonstop. On this side, you got Oscar drumming, drumming. His eyes looking wilder and wilder, speaking less. Carlos stopped talking. Sal drank wine. And he wondered what would happen next. Would Carlos continue the story? Or would he start another story? Forget that he had been telling a story? Or would the next part contradict everything that he said before? You never knew, because you never knew what was talking, Carlos or the heroine. Or Carlos and the heroine. Was it all made up? Was only part made up? So I remember the candy store. Remember the kid drumming on the pad. The summer came and went, and Oscar was drumming all day and into the night. Then what had to happen, happened. He wigged out. Oscar had been in the back, busy bringing bottles from the basement into the basement one, when he noticed that someone was calling him. That's when Manolo, his father, my uncle, that's his name, Manolo, when Manolo started yelling, hey, Oscar, what's taking you so long? Are you drinking my sodas? Now, see, I, I happen to know <coughs> that Oscar never drank sodas, never drank maltins. Oscar hated them, man, you know? The cigarettes was different. He cut the Lucy once in a while, but he hated the sweet drinks. So Oscar came out with a case of soda in his hand and put it down in the middle of the floor. Then he went over to his practice pad and he took the drumsticks in his hands, but he didn't play. He just sat over the practice pad. You ever seen a cat with his temper hanging over his water with a faraway look? That's how Oscar was sitting. And Manolo said, Jesus, sweet love. What's wrong, Oscar? Why aren't you practicing? Put that sort of box where it belongs. And Oscar got up from the counter. And he started to gently drum on his father's head. Oh. And almost started saying, Whoa, whoa. And started to back away. And all grabbed the broom and hit Oscar. And Oscar took the soda crate. One of them all went to have wind of steel. And he bashed his father over the head there. And when his father was on the floor, bleeding from a gash, all skull. Oscar started drumming on his head. Oscar's mother came in the store later, much later, late enough for the blood to be black and sticky on Manolo's head. Black and sticky on the drumsticks. But Oscar was sitting right there next to his passed out father, drumming, drumming on his head. And when Oscar saw her, he threw a bottle at her. Hit his mother right on the shoulder. She called the cops. I remember that kid, but I don't think I knew his name was Oscar, said Sal. They put wine cup in his hands. I remember that kid sitting there drumming, drumming, drumming. I used to think of him as a lucky kid. All the funny books, ice cream, sodas, everything the kid could want, right? <coughs> Wrong, said Carlos. Wrong as shit. That kid Oscar never got the right time of day from his old man. I know, he was my cousin. I was better off than him, and I had nothing, not even a father. You know, Carlos, I heard about the kid wigging out, but the story I got was that the kid had wigged out drumming and that a Pentecostal guy had cured the kid.
cured the kid by bringing him Jesus, and that then the old man and the old lady converted when they saw the miracle. Yeah, that's the story Manolo put out, but it wasn't like that. Take it from me, I swear to God, I swear to my mother. Carlos made the sign of the cross over himself. Then he put his right thumb over his right index finger's first joint, making a little cross, which he then kissed, mentioning the Holy Ghost. I'm in the family. My mother still gets mail from my Uncle Manolo. Manolo stood with a paralyzed face after that, either from the blood he lost or the blow. You could see that he couldn't smile right on one side of his face, you know? And Oscar went to a funny farm after they found him criminally insane. Can you beat that shit? It was his father who was criminally insane. But anyway, Oscar went upstate and he was doing good. He was like a trustee, you know? He worked with the gardeners, cutting grass, trimming hedges, like that. And he never was interested in music. But every time his father or mother went to visit him, he would get all worked up again. But finally, they put a prohibition on the folks from visiting. So they checked out the Puerto Rico. That's a fucked up story, isn't it? That's sound? No, man, that ain't a fucked up story. It's just a story. Yeah. And where is that kid now? I mean, Oscar, he's no kid anymore, do you know? Oscar, Oscar, my cousin, he's still here, on our corner, because we are talking about him. He is alive with us. Give me some more wine. Foul, sour, fill, two more cups of the sweet, sneaky pee, no longer cold. Yeah, I swear to my mother, said Carlos. Then he drank, as if it were a toast. He's here, on our corner. Then he crossed his right thumb over the first joint of his right index finger and kissed it, and he said, May my mother drop dead if Oscar's not here on this corner with us. Thank you. Espero que hayan disfrutado este programa y si les gustó, pues, regresen con nosotros la semana que viene. We hope you enjoyed this program. And if you did, well, come back next week. Vecinos Neighbors is looking for people who are interested in learning the art of video production. If you're active in the Latino community of Holyoke and you're bilingual, have a car, and are over 18 years of age, you can come and learn the art of video production. If you're interested, call Jeff Zomek at Continental Cablevision. Leave a message for the producers of Vecinos Neighbors. The number there is 562-9923, extension 269 562-9923 extension 269 
Si a usted le interesa aprender el arte de producción de vídeos, puede hacerlo con nosotros aquí en Vecinos Neighbors. Los requisitos son que si una persona que está envuelta en la comunidad latina de Holyoke, tiene 18 años, es mayor, tiene un auto, interés y es bilingüe en inglés y español. Si tiene interés, puede llamar a Jeff Zomek en Continental Cable Vision. Y ese número es 562-9923, extensión 269. Otra vez, ese número es 562-9923, extensión 269. Y pregunte o deje un mensaje por los productores de Vecinos Neighbors. Nos vemos.